On November 17, 1974, Sandy Fox was watching the evening news in a state of pure shock. Staring back at her from the TV was the charming and handsome man with whom she'd had recently had a two-day whirlwind romantic fling. He had the same movie star good looks and devilish grin that had drawn her to him in the first place, and so she could see how he had earned the nickname the media had given him, the Casanova Killer. The man she knew as Paul John Knowles was really a vicious serial killer who had killed as many as 35 innocent men, women, and children over a five-month period across six different states. Sandy now knew just how lucky she was to have survived their encounter. Paul John Knowles was born in Florida on April 14, 1946, and as a young boy he began getting into trouble with the law for petty crimes. After he was caught stealing at the tender age of nine, his father was fed up and decided he wanted nothing to do with young Paul. He was disowned and given up for adoption, and would spend the rest of his childhood years in reformatories and foster homes. Unsurprisingly, this did little to curb his criminal tendencies, and the young Knowles would continue to steal, vandalize, and generally get himself into trouble with the law throughout his teens. His first true arrest happened at the age of 19, and from that point on, Knowles would spend an average of half of each year in jail for crimes ranging from burglary to auto theft. By early 1974, Knowles was serving a prison sentence in Florida's Rayford Prison when he found himself a new pen pal in Angela Kovic. After exchanging letters for months, Kovic had fallen head over heels for Knowles. She traveled from California to Florida to visit him in prison, and soon the two were engaged. She used her meager savings to hire a lawyer who was able to successfully get parole for Knowles. Upon his release, he immediately flew from Florida to San Francisco, where the two planned to marry immediately. However, just days before the wedding was set to take place, Kovic called it off. She claimed that Knowles had an aura of evil surrounding him and that her psychic had warned her about a dangerous new man in her life. Angela didn't know it at the time, but that decision quite possibly saved her life. Knowles did not take their broken engagement well, to say the least. He would later claim that on the night of their breakup, he murdered three people in a blind rage, although investigators were never able to corroborate the story. What they do know for sure, though, is that Knowles flew back to Jacksonville, Florida, where he was jailed yet again after picking a fight in a local bar. If only that was the end of his story. Instead, on July 26, 1974, the veteran jailbird picked the lock on his cell and escaped from jail, setting off one of the most brutal crime sprees in American history. That very same night that he escaped from a holding cell in Jacksonville, Knowles broke into the home of 65-year-old Alice Curtis, gagging her and tying her up while he ransacked her home looking for cash and valuables. Sadly, Curtis choked to death on her own dentures, making her the first confirmed murder victim. Whether or not he intended for her to die, her death seemed to unleash something truly evil in Knowles and kicked off a brutal months-long murder spree. Knowles spent a few days hiding out in Curtis's home with her dead body, eating her food and watching her TV. When he saw his own mugshot on the local news, he realized he needed to get far away from Jacksonville. Shortly after stealing Curtis's car, Knowles was driving through Jacksonville looking for a place to drop the hot vehicle when he saw 11-year-old Lillian Anderson and her 7-year-old sister Millette walking down the street. He recognized them as friends of his mother's, and fearing that they might be able to identify him, he kidnapped the two young girls, strangled them both, and dumped their bodies in a swamp outside of town before hitting the open road. He had now killed three innocent people, and he knew that he needed to get out of the area as soon as possible. By the next day, Knowles was in Atlantic Beach, Florida, where he broke into the home of Marjorie Howe. This time, he wasted no time strangling Howe with a nylon stocking before stealing her TV and getting back on the road. As he had made his way aimlessly north, Knowles strangled a hitchhiker that he had picked up, bringing his official total to five victims in just a few short days. After the murder of the hitchhiker, Knowles appears to have laid low for a few weeks, but before long he would be back to his evil ways. On August 23, 1974, Knowles strangled Kathy Pierce in Musella, Georgia with a phone cord while her three-year-old son looked on. Oddly, he left the boy unharmed. On September 3, 1974, Knowles met a businessman William Bates in a bar in Lima, Ohio. After drinking together for several hours, he strangled Bates, dumped his body in the woods, and stole his money, credit cards, and car. Bates was Knowles' first known male victim, and his body wouldn't be found until October. Knowles drove Bates' stolen car all the way to Sacramento before making his way back east through Utah and Nevada, where he murdered campers Emmett and Lois Johnson near Ely, Nevada, on September 18th. Three days later, Knowles assaulted and murdered a female motorist who was stranded on the side of the road, leaving her body tangled in a barbed wire fence. 
On September 23rd, Knowles met Beautician Ann Dawson in Birmingham, Alabama. The two traveled together for a few days until Knowles grew bored of her. He killed her on September 29th, but her body would never be found. After brutally murdering at least 10 people across five different states, Knowles once again laid low for a few weeks, but it was only a matter of time before the urge to kill became unbearable. On October 19th in Woodford, Virginia, Knowles shot 53-year-old Doris Hovey in her home with her husband's rifle. This time, he did not assault or even rob Hovey. Clearly, his lust for blood was all that mattered to Knowles now. Shortly after the murder of Hovey, Knowles picked up two more hitchhikers. He planned to kill the pair, but before he could, he was stopped by police in a stolen car for a routine traffic violation. The careless cop let him off with a warning, but the experience rattled Knowles. After dropping off the hitchhikers, he contacted a lawyer and confessed to his crimes. The lawyer recommended that Knowles turn himself in, but he refused. Instead, he allegedly taped a confession and handed it over to the lawyer before skipping town once again. He instructed the lawyer to make the tape public in the event of his death and insisted that any proceeds from his story go on to his mother. Despite his close call, Knowles was unable to stop himself from continuing to kill. On November 6th in Macon, Georgia, he met and befriended Carswell Carr. Carr took pity on Knowles, who he took for a drifter, and invited him to spend the night at his home. Over drinks, Knowles stabbed Carr to death and then strangled Carr's 15-year-old daughter. After fleeing this murder, Knowles might have killed hitchhikers Edward Hilliard and Debbie Griffin, but their bodies were never found. On November 8th, Knowles was bar hopping in Atlanta, Georgia, when he met British journalist Sandy Fox. Fox recalls being infatuated with Knowles' gaunt good looks and his resemblance to movie star Robert Redford. The two spent the night together, although Knowles was unable to do the deed, so to speak. Over the next two days, after repeated failed attempts at intimate relations, the pair separated on good terms on November 10th. Fox had no idea at the time just how lucky she was to escape with her life, but she would later say that she suspects that he let her live because, as a writer, she would be able to spread his story and increase his notoriety. The day after separating from Fox, Knowles made his first big mistake. He attempted to kidnap Susan McKenzie, a friend of Fox, and assaulted her at gunpoint. Amazingly, she escaped and reported Knowles to the police. Officers now had a name to link to the rash of mysterious killings and tracked Knowles down and pulled him over. Knowles was prepared though, and he managed to escape by brandishing a sawed-off shotgun. Days later, Knowles was back in Florida. After murdering Beverly Maybe in West Palm Beach, he abducted Maybe's sister and stole her car. The next night, he released Maybe in Fort Pierce, Florida, unharmed. On November 16, 1974, a Florida state trooper recognized the stolen car that Knowles was driving and pulled him over. However, Knowles was ready for him. He took the officer hostage at gunpoint, put him in the back of the police car, and took off in the stolen cruiser. Realizing that a stolen police car was incredibly obvious, Knowles used the cruiser to pull over another innocent motorist. After kidnapping the driver, James Meyer, he put both hostages in the back of Meyer's vehicle and drove out into the woods of Pulaski County, Georgia. There, he handcuffed the men to a tree and shot them both in the head at close range. The blatant murder of a police officer would spell the beginning of the end for Knowles. Just hours later, Knowles approached a police roadblock that had been erected to capture him. With no other options, Knowles crashed his stolen car through the barrier, lost control of the vehicle, and crashed into a tree. An injured Knowles then escaped on foot into the woods, firing shots at officers as he fled. Knowles was pursued by officers from several agencies armed with dogs and a helicopter, but in the end he would meet his downfall at the hands of a civilian. 27-year-old David Clark, a Vietnam veteran and avid hunter, spotted Knowles in the woods several miles away from the official search area on November 17th. Seeing that Knowles was bleeding from the wound on his head, the suspicious hunter cornered Knowles with his shotgun and held him at a neighbor's home until police arrived, finally putting an end to the vicious murder spree. Once in custody, Knowles claimed to have murdered more than 35 people between July and November of 1974, though police were only able to verify 18 of his murders. On November 18th, the day after his capture, Knowles was being transferred to a maximum security facility when he made one last desperate bid for freedom. He made a grab for the sheriff's revolver, which went off during the scuffle, prompting FBI agent Ron Angel to shoot Knowles three times at point-blank range, killing him instantly. The Casanova killer had met his own brutal and final end. 
Even after Knowles' death, the police and the public remained fascinated by his crimes. His movie star good looks, charisma, and devilish smirk endeared him to his victims and earned him his nickname the Casanova Killer. His constant movement crisscrossing the country and the fact that he murdered victims in six different states made it hard for police to link his various murders to a single killer. There appeared to be no pattern to his victims, and he indiscriminately killed men and women and children and adults. Knowles had no consistent MO, stabbing some victims, strangling others, and shooting the rest. Some were assaulted and robbed, while others were simply killed for no apparent reason. By the time the police connected the seemingly random crimes to a single killer, it was too late for his victims. His death in custody at the hands of the FBI meant Knowles would never have to explain the motivations for his crimes in court. The taped confession he had left with his lawyer may have been the key to unlocking the Casanova killer's motives, but sadly the tapes were allegedly destroyed when the courtroom they were being stored in was damaged by a flood. The lawyer who received the tapes from Knowles claims to not have listened to them before they were destroyed and refuses to speculate on Knowles' motives, standing by his commitment to client confidentiality. Perhaps his traumatic childhood and his father's abandonment set the stage for Knowles to go on to become a killer. Maybe the heartbreak of his broken engagement prompted him to graduate from petty crime to vicious murder. Or maybe his motive was simply to gain notoriety and fame for his brutal crimes. The fact that he let journalist Sandy Fox go free and unharmed, and the fact that his murders seemed to be crimes of opportunity rather than targeted killings appear to add credence to this theory. But we'll never know for sure why Paul John Knowles was driven to kill. If you thought serial killers from the 70s were bad, be sure and check out this video called Why This Generation Will Have More Serial Killers Than Ever, or perhaps this other video will be a little less unnerving.